This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, Presonus, Spectra 1964, and API Audio. So get ready to rock. Music is experiencing renaissance. Genre lines are blurred. There's very interesting artists that are like the biggest thing in the world, like Billie Eilish, for instance. We are in a good time period. There's great bands. They're doing original things again. There's so many great producers now. Digital technology has come such a long way to where that whole thing about it sounding sterile or not as good, that's been debunked now. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you feel like the fast pace of computer tech has made your studio Mac obsolete, then think again. OWC is your personal studio tech for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and use Macs perfect for recording and mixing. Why ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with the Mac you've already got? Learn how to supercharge your studio and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC.com so that you can focus on making great music. If you want a digital audio workstation that will give life to your music from sketching a new idea to composing, editing, mixing, and mastering a finished record, then you want Studio One from Presonus. Studio One is easy to use with intuitive drag and drop simplicity, making it great for beginners, yet flexible and powerful for experienced producers. Whether creating beats, recording a band, or composing a blockbuster film soundtrack, you will find everything you need to create your masterpiece. Download your free version of Studio One Prime and get started now at Presonus, wherever sound takes you. Hey, rock stars! it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you get to make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Al Levy, the CEO of URM Academy, the world's best school for rock and metal producers. Al is a critically acclaimed entrepreneur, musician, podcaster, educator, and producer, having cut his teeth as the guitarist and primary songwriter in Doth, a progressive death metal band that released albums on Roadrunner and Century Media. In 2014, he founded URM Academy, which is Unstoppable Recording Machine, an online education platform for producers with thousands of students from across the globe, URM is best known for its flagship program, Nail the Mix. The platform hosts some of the most prestigious rock and metal producers, including Tom Lord Algae, Will Putney, Dan Lancaster, Daniel Bergstrand, Jens Bogren, Adam Nolly Getgood, Frederick Nordstrom, and Kurt Ballou, among dozens of others. An accomplished speaker and educator, he has logged hundreds of hours teaching the next generation the craft and business of music production. His URM podcast is now in its fifth year with over 250 episodes. And in the studio, he's worked with The Black Dahlia Murder, The Monuments, The Contortionist, Chelsea Grin, Firewind, and many others. In 2017, Al co-founded Riff Hard with Monuments guitarist John Brown. Riff Hard is an online guitar school dedicated to the most important part of modern metal, rhythm guitar. So please welcome Al Levy to Recording Studio Rockstar's Al, my man, are you ready to rock, dude? Always ready to rock. I would hope so, man. That's kind of in your uh, in your credo. Three sixty five. Three sixty five <laughs> never ends. Do you have like a gold uh, three sixty five chain that you get to wear or anything like that? I'm not at gold chain level yet, but uh, you can always aspire <laughs> to always aspire to greater things. Well, dude, it's great to have you on the show, man. Um, it's really cool to meet you. I know you guys have been doing such a cool thing for a long time, and I've really only been able to um, see it kind of from the periphery, so I'm excited to learn more about what you're doing at URM. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Sure, man. Um, so just to preface this, rock stars, uh, you're going to be hearing this again in hindsight, but we're doing this over Skype from our home studios, uh, I guess Atlanta to Nashville. Is that right? Yep. And we're both in the coronavirus lockdown right now. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be looking back at this um, many months later and going, boy, that was a crazy time. And, and everybody here, both on the show and listening, will be healthy and well. I hope so. Uh, 
I, I would say wash your hands and stay home. But since this is coming out afterwards, I'll say, I hope you washed your hands and yeah. <laughs> stayed home. Indeed, man. Indeed. Um, well, thanks for joining us, dude. Give us a little bit of a background uh, in your own words as to to who you are. You know, how'd you get started in music and, um, you know, the brief version, but you were in the band Doth and now you've, you've got this incredible teaching platform. So uh, I started playing guitar when I was 13 and wanted to be in a huge band and just worked my ass off at guitar, nothing but guitar. When and were you, my were you growing up in Atlanta at that point too? Yeah, I was growing up in Atlanta and I guess it, it bears mentioning that I come from a musical family. So it was, it was just in my DNA to do music. Uh, my dad's a symphony conductor and I started playing violin and piano when I was three. Oh, so nice, it, man. I think to rebel against him though, I started doing metal. Suzuki? When I was 13. Yeah, Suzuki. Yeah, me too at four. Yeah, yeah. So you you know the pain. I know the pain. <laughs> 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 yeah, basically. Uh it it kind of scarred me actually, because um I would I would practice with him. Like he would run my practice sessions and I think he was used to dealing with child prodigies, you know, like they have like these mm-hmm. seven-year-olds that will play entire concertos and are basically little geniuses. And I think that he kind of expected that out of me. Uh, and so it was a painful experience having to learn those instruments. So as soon as I got a uh, rebellious hair in my body, uh, I went straight to guitar. Nice, yeah. man. You know, in all fairness, I think it was a painful people, uh, a painful experience for people to have to listen to me learn violin too. I, I, I'm sure that's the ca- same case with me as well. <laughs> well, that's the thing about violin is it's one of those instruments that you can't be mediocre at. Like yeah. get, with guitar, you can be mediocre. It's actually pretty easy to be mediocre. Anybody just about can be mediocre and mediocre at guitar can be pretty passable. Lots of people in big bands are mediocre at guitar, but there's no middle ground with violin. You're either awesome or you suck. (laughs) And until you're awesome, you suck. You know, I I played, I picked it up again in college and, uh, and sort of built my own pickup and sort of was kind of playing scratchy fiddle in a, in a, twang band up in St. Louis. And, uh, and my, the tone of my violin from the stage was described as getting your teeth drilled by the dentist. So I know what you oh, that's mean. That's pleasant. <laughs> that's, that's, that's quite a clump, compliment there. <laughs> well, sorry. Right. So you switched to guitar. Yeah. And, uh, it was again, in the interest of having a band that was huge. So that, that was kind of my entire focus, uh, for, many, many, many years. Yeah. And uh, I'll spare you the part about, you know, going to Berkeley and all that stuff. But eventually I did form the band. uh, And eventually through a ton of work, the band got signed to Roadrunner. And we we put out three albums and toured the world, did all of that. However, parallel to that, I was recording the whole time. And the reason that I started recording was because back in those days, and this was like the late 90s, you'd go to studios and barely anybody recorded metal. So you, you'd go to these studios that were $500, 600 $700 a day, and nobody in there listened to metal, uh, which is a style of music that you have to understand in order to be good at recording. And so you'd waste all this money and just come out with, a pile of garbage. And it was so frustrating and so expensive that at some point I just decided I'm going to learn how to do this because uh, if I want to get an album done for real, I, I calculated that it would be like thirty to $40,000 if I really, really do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, may as well just learn. And so I got had these student credit cards and I maxed them out on, uh, you know, microphones and just got, got to learning. And this was in about 2000. So, uh, so basically by 2003, I was recording clients, um, 
bad local bands, but still clients. And then by 2006, the band had gotten signed. So this entire time I was recording uh, and little by little getting better and better and better. And the thing that was super frustrating about recording in those days was there was no information online or anywhere. Uh, now, were you, were you tape and console at that point? Uh, or had uh, you moved to Pro Tools and computer yet? Well, I had, I went, when I went to the studio, um, they were using tape and console. And one thing that was really, really interesting was the first producer that I ever worked with <laughs> was a, he was a really bad heroin addict. Okay. Um, and just think about what a, <laughs> what a shithead this guy is. So imagine <laughs> a 15 year old going to record with a 35 year old and the 35 year old is doing heroin in front of him the whole time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, good influence, right? Yeah. Um, and what happened as a result is he would get really high and not off. And at, I guess he took to me or something and was like, Hey, this is how you record. This is how you loop. This is how you operate this thing. I'm going to go to sleep. Uh, so there I was recording the band. There was the so blessing the, in disguise. Yeah. yeah, that was actually the beginning. That was, that was before I maxed out the credit cards. Then another thing that happened was uh, this guy, so this guy's addiction was, played a big part in me starting to record. Somehow he married this millionaire, um, lady. Uh, I think she inherited like $3 million and uh, she was totally clean. Uh, by the way, don't do drugs. Um, right. She was totally clean and she didn't know that he was an, uh, that he was a junkie, but he moved into her house, big house and just started acting like, like MC Hammer, basically. If you know that story, that uh, I just remember, you know, I just picture him dancing sideways. That's all I got. Well, well, the story of Hammer was that he made all this money and then got an entourage of like forty people and paid them all too much and got like gold plated faucets and uh, bankrupted himself. Anyways, he spent all her money. Then he convinced her to try heroin, and uh, and then they both became junkies and were just hemorrhaging money and he was hawking off his gear. And I think at one point he was like, here, I want you to try uh, this compressor. It's a 3630 and, uh, and this microphone is SM57. Just take them home, try them out. And if you like them, you can pay me for them. And I took them and then I never heard from him again. So that's how I got my first gear too. That's awesome. And the 3630 was such an important piece of gear for us back then too. I know. <laughs> so, Isn't that funny? So rock stars, if you don't know that one, that is the, uh, is it Alesis? Yeah, Alesis, right? yeah. Yeah, the yep. Alesis 3630 was the first affordable like take home compressor for your home studio. Yep. Um, and really versatile stereo. You could, it, they each had a gate built in. So you could get this combination. I think that's right, right? Didn't we have gates in this? Man, well? I don't remember. <laughs> I've actually got one in the rack. I could look at it. But anyway, it was just very cool. It was like, uh, I mean, I guess for us today, that's like maybe new DAW or new plug-in or, you know, affordable mics. But just that having that first thing come along that go, that makes you go like, crap, I can I can actually have my own studio and have something that that is seems sort of pro is pretty exciting. Yeah. I guess I, I just had no idea how to use it. Okay, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> I don't so, know. I didn't know where your story was going. Whether it was uh, headed to a good, good thing or bad. Well, mm, well, the thing is, I think more than anything, uh, it's not like I got any quality recordings off of that stuff. Mm -hmm. It was more than I think the seed was planted that this was something that was doable. Because back in those days, when you went into a studio, it was like walking into an airplane cockpit, right? So yeah. if you didn't know what any of the stuff was. It was just insanity, right? So actually having some of the gear, being taught how to operate it, made it seem like it was just a very doable thing. Yeah. So I think that that's where the confidence to actually say, why don't I just get my own gear and pay for this myself and just do it and fuck all these local studios that are going to charge me 30 grand to put out a really bad metal record. 
So oh, when you did you guys start making the Doth records? And am I pr- I'm pronouncing it right, Doth? Yeah, Doth. Okay, wonderful. Um, did you guys make your own records in your studio from that point on? Yes, yes, we did. Uh, so we recorded, we recorded in my studio. Um, in fact, everything we ever recorded was uh, was done in my studio up until like long into being signed. So, and, and we would record it and then just hire really good mixers to mix it. Right on. Which I think uh, this is something that I would say to people who are first coming up, if they have similar types of goals, like they're in a band and they're learning how to mix and they're, they have aspirations, but they're not that good yet. Uh, hire somebody. Um, yeah. Because I felt I felt like even though I could mix, this was about 2004, I really, really wanted to get noticed by a major label, which is a crazy thing to want with a death metal band, but that, that was my goal. And I figured that unless I have somebody who can really, really, really mix, like way better than I could, they're not going to even pay attention. So I did that and, and it paid off. So I think the, the lesson learned or the, the message I'm trying to get across is to, you know, try as hard as you can, obviously to get as good as possible and have the, the grandest aspirations possible, but also know your limits and know when, uh, when you're being outclassed and when to outsource. Yeah. I mean, mean, sort of like a lesson for, uh, so many aspects of what we do. Don't get in your own way. Yes, um, exactly. If it's gonna, if it's gonna prevent you from t- doing the thing you you really want to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. You want the critical details from your microphone to get through to your recording, and the Spectra 1964 101 amplifier provides just that. With unequaled headroom, low noise, and a linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks. Used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, and John Lennon, Spectra 1964 brings that same incredible sound to your studio with the new STX 600 mic pre with built-in comp limiter. Start making classic records again at spectra1964.com. Are you sick of microphones that make your music sound harsh and brittle? The new Amethyst mic by Jay-Z Microphones brings you a rich, warm tone with perfect detail using the Golden Capsule technology. Resulting from 30 years of microphone design, the Amethyst is hand-built using carefully selected parts with Class A discrete circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and an advanced shock mount to make sure your recording sound awesome. This is my voice on the Amethyst right now. Use the limited-time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Amethyst Mike at jzmike.com. Um, very cool. So let me ask you this question. I mean, maybe maybe we're jumping forward pretty quickly here, but um, and we don't have to get too technical or anything. But you know, you describe going into the studios in the '90s and and do wanting to do the metal, get get a metal sound. But I imagine that studios like rock to them means like Pearl Jam and Soundgarden at this point. Yep. Um, and so what, you know, how, how would you describe some of the differences between that aspect of recording and what's, what's appropriate for metal, if you want to just get into that topic more? Well, metal in those days or metal now? Uh, um, you know what? Feel free to educate me on that because I, I feel like a, I, I, get the, I get the lucky position of being a beginner here at this, at this interview. So, so let's just uh, be honest about most metal. Most metal is not really live music. Even though there's some really, really great live bands, it's not generally created in a live sort of way, Mm -hmm. Uh, in the way that lots of rock bands will do. Um, The four dudes jamming in a room thing, and only the top, 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 top tier of metal bands are capable of of, uh, pulling that off. And if you've ever been to a metal show, you'll know that it generally sounds like garbage. And that's because metal sounds like garbage unless you carve it like crazy. Like Mm -hmm. everything about it is wrong in terms of, uh, in terms of arrangement in a traditional way. And in terms of frequency balance, like everything is stepping on top of everything else. Everything is distorted. Everything is just 
in a constant fight. And so it has to be meticulously carved, uh, and which is why if you don't know what you're listening for and, uh, and you don't understand the genre, you're just not going to get it right. And so if you mix a metal record like a rock record, it's going to sound like noisy, flubby, tubby garbage. Mm-hmm. Um, it's and- like, it's, it'd be like trying to arrange for an orchestra and picking all the wrong instruments to play the parts. Absolutely. Or uh, not just not necessarily even that. Maybe you pick the right instruments, but you voice them in the wrong registers. Right, right. Uh, so, you know, picking or, you know, you have everything, including the high instruments and low registers. And then you're trying to get differentiation out of, like, say, you can't have a, a low melody along with a low bass line, along with a low riff, along with a low bass guitar, along with a low vocal just sound good. But it doesn't work that way. The physics of it don't work. And so uh, a lot of other genres of music, like almost every other genre of music is arranged properly to where the, the bass is the bass and there's nothing going on in that range to interfere with it. And so it's a lot easier to get a balanced, even big sound. Right. But uh, with metal, none such luck. So again, you have to really, really know it. You have to understand it and then you have to be basically in my opinion an eq master right and, and it, the the dudes at those rock studios just couldn't cut it they probably just had no clue where to go with it you know that, that's you? exactly it and these were these are good engineers like the the these were not these were not hacks by any by any stretch of the imagination yeah um they they just like I said, it's this is a genre of music that you have to know. You have to know, and and it's the same with playing it. Um, w- one of the things I noticed, like going to Berkeley, was that you would have these players that were incredible players. They could do everything imaginable. They could sit in with a jazz band. They could then go play covers. They could then do a session. They could go do a Broadway tune, all that stuff. They can read like crazy, but then you put them in a metal context and they sounded like complete beginners. Then again, you take the metal dudes, you put them in those other aspects and they also sounded like beginners. Right. (laughs) Because metal is such a specific, specific, uh, focused genre of music. So, yeah, but I love the image of, of a jazz ensemble and they all just look like metal heads with like long black hair hanging down. You can't really see their face. I mean, <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> um, well, that's very cool. Well, what here, let me back up for a sec. So you talked about the importance of EQ, um, yep. but let's, let's, let's back up another level and also just talk about the, the importance of choosing the right instrument and stuff like that. Cause I imagine, you know, if you start out with a drum kit that would just be so cool for your sleepy bedroom indie rock, um, you're you're going to struggle to get that to sound like the right drum kit for a metal, you know, metal kick drum and snare and and even cymbals and stuff, and and other instruments too, like um, like a, a Fender P bass. How often is that the bass instrument that you would find on an appropriate I, metal I, production? Actually. Uh, P bass was one of my go-tos. All right, um, dig it. Uh, but so, okay, with the drums, it's a very interesting topic because at the end of the day, I think just like this is, I think that this is true across genres with live drums is that the number one factor always and forever is the drummer himself or herself. Right. So uh, you can take the the best tuned best chosen, best set up, best mic, best everything, uh, drum set, uh, through the nicest preamps, all that stuff. And if the drummer isn't right, it's going to sound like garbage. Uh, so first and foremost, when it comes to metal drums, you got to have a drummer who can pull it off. And the thing about pulling it off is that to be good at metal drums is, like being an Olympic athlete. So yeah, they're very few and far between, but uh, when they're good, they're good. And from there, then, then choosing the right, the right wood type, the right depth, the right heads, the right symbols, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. That stuff is secondary. In now, my opinion. W- would it be safe to describe the drum 
the length of each individual drum is typically shorter in duration than like, you know, like a, a wide open um, Black Beauty on a backbeat of a rock song, for example? Okay, so yes and no. Um, you got to be real careful here because a lot of that ring that you get on wide open drums helps helps the drum stand out. However, at the same time, obviously you don't want to have a sound that's too loose and roomy or else when you know when you get to the fast parts it just it turns into a mess so there's differing level there's differing ideologies mm -hmm. on this but i've seen everything from producers who basically say that the toms are like little kick drums that they basically tune them and mute them to where they're just like just like basically the impact mm -hmm. and maybe 300 milliseconds of uh, of tom tone and then that's it and then some dudes are all about it being wide open and the thing is you can't discount the use of samples in metal uh samples on the drums are basically a mainstay right. 99% of the time well i think that goes all, that even goes all the way back to um Master of Puppets and Metallica and stuff, doesn't it? I think, yeah, man. I mean, think about it. Kick drum, what does a kick drum sound like? It's like basically mostly low-end thud with a little bit of click. But because of the arrangement issue uh, with the guitars completely interfering with that low end, with the bass completely interfering with that, if you want to have any definition, especially at high speeds, you need a lot more click to it than a kick drum normally has right and so you kind of gotta kind of gotta massage it a little bit with samples obviously you it really helps to have a player who can pull it off right and who's got really really solid feet but uh and two pedals samples and yeah and two <laughs> pedals um and just just to throw it out there i remember hearing a, a great story i i believe it was about um black sabbath paranoia that they were starting to experiment with like taping a quarter to the inside of the the beater head of the kick drum. Yeah, yeah, they, people do like that. that. They'll put that uh, that or like little pieces of plastic. That helps. Um uh, Vinny Paul from Pantera, he would do that, I believe, with the either the quarter or the piece of plastic or like a little piece of metal. Um and it helps, but it, it, when you compare that sound to the modern kick drum that we're used to. Right. That's that would that would be an old school kind of Yes. Yeah. 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 It, it just it just is what it is. Um now the thing is I don't want to put out the idea that I'm against live drums or anything like that. I always say that the best scenario is an incredible drummer in an incredible room with incredible gear, getting incredible takes and then samples uh used for uh reinforcement rather than replacement. Right. I think that's that's the pinnacle. Right, um, right. And, and man, you just, I'm not going to say you need it because I have heard records that are all natural, but if you want that modern sound where the drums really cut through everything uh, and they're even as hell, you got to reinforce them. Well, you know, there was, um, the you, you shared a bunch of great videos with us, um, which Rockstars you can find in the show notes too. So I put a playlist together of, um, the music that that Al has done, and also some of the teaching videos and stuff from URM. But one of them was that the uh, Norwegian black metal band Vredesbird or something like that. How you pronounce it? But that that was a cool example of like oh Dimu Borgir. Uh, yeah, the, is that yeah. how you say Dimu Borgir? I love it. I think, oh right, I, well, no, he's the mixer, right? Yeah. Uh, well, no, no, the band is Dimu Borgir. Um, the song is. Man, I can't pronounce it like Freder's beard or something. Right, right. There's probably some weird Nordic pronunciation. The mixer is a guy named Frederick Nordstrom. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, um, and it's off of an album called Death Cult Armageddon. Um, now that that's a very interesting band because and their records are very interesting because they combine orchestra with this genre yeah. of music. So think about something that's already impossible to. Uh, to arrange, which mm -hmm. is metal. And then you take the other style of music, which is like the most complex, full frequency uh, 
thing imaginable and then you put them together and it really shouldn't work. But they made it work, which is why I made that video because it's so impressive. Like combining those two genres in a way that sounds good and makes musical sense is it's like an, again, I'll use the word, it's like an Olympic feat of mixing, in my opinion. I I imagine that you hesitated in titling the video like one of the titles that you almost considered was See Dad, I Told You So. Well, you want to know what's funny is when that came out, I played it for him and he was not impressed. (laughs) (laughs) He he said it was, uh, he he was like, this is just some John Williams ripoff shit, basically. I love it. He was, I I, I was like, listen, I was so excited to show him like, wow, it was finally done, like metal and orchestra. And he just, not, uh, not cool with this. This is his job to just keep you on your toes, right? I, I don't, I just think that's who he is. If you're ready to upgrade your studio to the famous sound of API's large format consoles, then you're ready for The Box, a small format console featuring the same analog circuitry and original 2520 op amp design that has made API famous for 50 years. Record through eight world-class mic pre-channels, mix through 24 smooth-as-glass faders, and blend mics, analog effects, and parallel compression at the speed of electrons rather than the speed of your computer latency. Upgrade your home studio to legendary status with The Box from apiaudio.com. Well, so um, one of the things I picked up on listening to that video was, um, you know, I'm not sure where samples come into that equation. Um, I don't remember if you spoke about that in the the video, but I did pick up on hearing like the high-speed kick drum, and it was clear to me that we're hearing the performance that is live, but just incredibly tight. You know, so it didn't sound like it was a kick drum that's laid out perfectly on a Pro Tools grid. It sounded like it was performed really well. Okay, so that drummer, his name is Nick Barker. Uh, He's one of the best of all time. And what's interesting about him is that he was doing a hybrid kit even back in the day before hybrid kits and all that were even commonplace. So he would play with like a, with like a, like one of those mesh snares and would and would trigger it. But then he'd have like real kick drums and stuff. It, it was it was totally hybrid. Um, and But he, he played his ass off and you're hearing the real performance. And of course, there's some editing. Of course, there's always going to be some editing. Um, and there's samples on it, but that is actually, that's the way that dude sounds. Like yeah. when, when you hear him live, like... Uh, like his whole sound is a blend of those two of, I don't even want to say fake, just live and sampled. Uh, but it's, he did, he does it in a completely artistic way. And it's also, it, it's a, it's an intentional thing. Yeah. Which it's not, it's not done because he sucks and you just got to replace it or you got to reinforce it because he can't keep up. No, it's actually a very interesting and uh, intentional choice, which I think is why when you hear it, you're saying it sounds like a dude. It sounds like someone actually playing, which it is. And even though there are samples on it, it is, it's the real thing. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's a thing that you have to understand when you first start trying to wrap your brain around it is like the, the sound reinforcement for a big giant stage production like that is not about taking the exact sound that's on the stage and just making it louder through speakers. It's like Correct. The, now the, the, the drum set all the way through to the big main speakers, that is your new instrument. And so like yeah, you, have exactly to right. build, you have to build a machine that plays the right sound coming out of those speakers. And now that's your kick drum. Yes, that's, that's exactly the right way to look at it. And these bands, especially the black metal bands, they're all about a certain atmosphere, right? That's the, yeah, I know some bands are all about we played it. This is what we sound like. And that's our thing. But these guys, the Norwegian dudes, they're all about creating an atmosphere, a, a vibe. They want you to feel something very specific when you hear their music. And it's supposed to evoke something. And they'll make the decisions necessary uh, in crafting the sounds to evoke those reactions out of people. Whether it's live drums or sample drums or whatever. 
uh, the point isn't, like you said, to just get the sound and turn it up. The point is to elicit a certain emotion. Yeah. And they'll do whatever it takes. Yeah. And if anybody's still struggling with that concept, it's just, just take the analogy of the electric guitar. The sound of an electric guitar yep. is not just to take a clean DI sound and make it louder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> man, can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why we like all the amp tones and everything. Just think about the entire mix as like an extension of your amp tone, I guess, right? Yes, that's, that's exactly, that's, I love the way you put it. Share a story about, um, you know, making your own records in your studio with Doth and, um, you know, were there any failures along the way for you that turned into great learning experiences through that process? Nothing but failures. Um, so the thing that I learned the most from making my own records, which then definitely played into how I approached recording other people's records, because after Doth, that's when I got into a, a big studio and started working on other people's records. Uh, what I learned that really helped out a lot was that you need to take every take really seriously, regardless of if it's just a demo or just a writing idea or whatnot, because I had the, I'm sure that everybody listening has had this experience and uh, tell me if this rings true. You do the demo and you record something and it's just got a certain feel to it, vibe that is perfect. It might not sound great, but it just feels just right. Yeah. And then you go to do the album and you just can't get to that spot again. Like maybe it sounds better technically, but it's just not artistically right. Yeah. And that would, that really, really bothered me because I would put so much time into writing the Doth demos and giving them that feel. And then we would hire these mixers. Like, man, we had some of the best mixers in the world mixing Doth. Like a guy named Colin Richardson, who was like the top, top guy in metal at the time. And, uh, and the record he mixed for us was incredible. It sounds great. But even he wasn't able to take some of the stuff that we re-recorded and make it, give it the same thing as the demos. And then I realized, what I realized from that was, okay, you have to, you have to take it seriously from moment one. And so that doesn't mean that while you're writing that you have to get the most perfect take ever and slow down your writing process if you're in the zone. But if you're writing on guitar, for instance, make sure your guitars are well set up. Make sure yeah. you've got a good, clean DI. Don't be clipping it like crazy. Make sure you take all the right precautions so that whatever it is that you record on the demo can be flown into the actual album because chances are that a lot of that stuff is going to be better than when it gets re-recorded. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, so it's like, don't, don't phone in any of the moves in the process because you might... Never phone anything in. Yeah, you might need that to be your... Take, take that particular thing you just did today all the way to the finish line. Yeah, because, I mean, creation is all about a moment in time, right? Yeah. It, it's, I've often thought about the fact that, you know, if I woke up five minutes later on a certain day and started writing this great idea that I had may not have happened just well, from starting five minutes later. Well, even the Rolling Stones were doing that. They were bringing in the cassette recording into the final album. Um, I forgot which song that was, Wild Horses or something like that, um, where they just couldn't get it right again in the studio, so they just, they just flew in the cassette demo. Yeah, man, because you can't recreate a moment in time. That's, that, that's kind of what there is to it. So on the other hand, though, then... If you're not good at recording and you're writing, uh, so if you don't know how to record properly and you're going to go record with somebody else and uh, you're making demos that, and you can't do what I just said, my advice would then be to completely underthink the demos so that you don't basically blow your load all the way. <laughs> right, uh, right. So basically get them as, get like a sketch on your demos and then 
count on the studio with your producer to be where the, the real stuff happens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sort of, um, make them easy to beat. Yes, absolutely. Well, so here's one thing that I think is that will probably resonate with everybody. That's very common is how quickly you pick up an instrument, a guitar or something, and you come up with this great idea and you put it down. And then later you go back and, and realize that you forgot to tune it to the tuner before you started. And now, you, correct. now you're stuck. I did this on my own record where I think I even was tuning, but somehow I got it dialed in when I'd perform it. And then later I had to come back and figure out how to dial mm -hmm. my, um, my strobe tuner mat to match the tuning of my original guitar so that every other overdub that happened was in tune with the original. Yeah. And you know what? Thankfully, now there's some tools like Melodyne where you can fix more stuff than you used to be able to. And there's also Evertune guitars, which are a godsend. But right, those, Evertune is that the the crazy floating bridge or something like that? It, it's not a floating bridge, but it's uh, it's this device that basically gets built into your guitar that keeps it in tune. I mean, you can bend the strings and they will not change pitch. Wow, it's craziness. Which um, and tuning is a huge, 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 huge part of uh, recording metal, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a huge part of music, right? But uh, again, like I was saying with metal, since metal is like such a basically clusterfuck of elements interfering with other elements, if you then add out of tune uh, instruments to that, you're just asking for trouble. And guitar is also very easy to play out of tune because it's not it's not a well designed instrument. Um, it's just it's just not. It's it, even if you get it well set up, just pick, picking a little too hard pressing down a little too hard with your left hand or playing an octave, uh, you know, but in the wrong spot and you're going to be out of tune, even if you're in tune with the tuner and you're well set up and all that. Evertune solves all of those problems. Now, is that a topic that you and your dad would totally agree on? Would he say the same thing about an arrangement in an orchestra that like tuning is really critical? Oh yeah. He calls it intonation though, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, um, it, and that's one of the big things actually with orchestras that determines a lot of their quality is how well intonated they are. I can believe that. I've learned that in the studio only through the process. When you get into layering more elements into a production, the um, it's like an exponential growth of crap, you know, oh, yeah. in your absolutely. recording if things aren't really in tune. Yeah, man, that's that's why the cliche of, you know, get it right at the source um, is so, so important. Uh, the more complex of a, an arrangement and a mix that you have, the more important that becomes, especially when you're dealing with low end, let me just yeah. say. Uh, the it, first thing it, everybody forgets to make sure that's, that it's really in tune. And it's the easiest thing to get out of tune. Yeah. Because a bass guitar, you just... You just pick it a little bit harder and suddenly it's like 14 cents sharp. Mm -hmm. um, it, by the way, I heard that Evertune bass is on the way or is out, um, which is a godsend. But uh, the moment that bass is even a little out of tune, holy shit, it's like building a house on a cardboard foundation. Yeah, but, and it's one of those weird things where like you could, it's amazing how long you could work on that track this is before you're really trained to know what to look for. You could work on that track for quite a while, not realizing that it's the bass that's making you just not like what you're hearing. Yes, that's absolutely right. Um, which is why uh, now one of the things that I adopted when making records is in the pre-pro stage. And what I mean by pre-pro is not like pre-pro with the band necessarily. Um, where you're like helping craft the songs. I mean, even if you're not hired to do pre-pro, there's still an element of setup that you have to do, right? Of um, maybe bringing in their click tracks or just setting up the session, all of that. Whatever whatever amount of pre-production you have, uh, I would always program a synth bass before we started recording. Oh, smart. Uh, for, because then, because first of all, typically in metal, you record guitars before the bass. Um, or even if you record the bass before the guitars, it's just so hard to know if you're really, really in or not. And so that synth bass just gives you a a perfect 
a, basically a perfect anchor. Now, would you have to, would you put down a synth bass and then go straight to instruments above that register and then come back and replace it with live bass? Or would you, would you be able to add a bass to the synth bass and then continue working from there? All the above. It just totally depends on the project. Uh, because sometimes, even if you do have the synth bass and track a, a real bass on top of it, um, sometimes it, part of like a mixing technique that some people use works sometimes, other times it doesn't, is that they will basically high pass the bass guitar and just use like the mids from the bass guitar, like to get the pick attack and the, the character of it, um, or even just the lows and the mids. And then they'll take the sub from the synth bass so that your foundation is just perfect. So that's cool. But some, that's cool. Sometimes, sometimes not though. Sometimes, sometimes it's, you can't get it to sound like one instrument. Like it'll literally sound like two instruments, like a sub and a bass guitar. Um, sometimes it's better to just replace it with somebody playing. And then on some records, uh, it's better to just have the synth bass period. It totally depends. Totally depends on the scenario. That's a trip, man. My brain is imagining even doing a quick bass and then just like, just flatlining it in, in Melodyne Yes. And sort of having that play back the synth just for the root parts and, and leave sure. the top on there and then maybe come back and replace it later or something. Sure, sure. Like you could do that too. I mean, the, the, however you get there doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, the point is just to have a, an anchor that's perfectly in tune uh, for you to then build on top of. So if it, if it is what you said, just record a, a live bass and then melodyne it like, Melodyne the shit out of it. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. That works. Awesome. Whatever whatever gets you there. Awesome, man. Well, I love that you just shared that tip with us. That is, I, having done, like you, you know, 250 plus interviews now, you, you pick up on these takeaways where you're like, yes, that's a first for the podcast. So, Rockstars, there you go. There's a, there's a golden nugget for you. Write that down. And um, awesome, man. Thank you. It will save your ass. Yeah. You know what it feels like when inspiration hits and you want to capture your great song idea, but then the studio gets in the way and it's just no fun anymore. Wouldn't it feel awesome if you could simplify the process of producing your music from inspiration to final masterpiece? PreSona Studio One is a powerful digital audio workstation that helps you compose your music with a complete collection of virtual instruments for keyboards and drums, MIDI tools for hip hop, EDM, and film, a flexible sketch pad with chord charts and key recognition for songwriting and arranging, and classic effects pedals and amp simulators for guitar and bass. With 37 high quality effects plugins, integrated Melodyne, and drag and drop flexibility, you can easily edit and polish your mixes. And Studio One is the only DAW with a built-in mastering studio so that you can take your record from writing to radio ready all in one place. Download your free version of Studio One Prime and get started now at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you. If you're using a Mac in your recording studio and you're tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly, then Otherworld Computing is the solution for you. OWC can help keep your existing Mac and studio current and relevant so that you can make great music. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac, you can get the most mileage out of your studio with OWC. Offering a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49, there's no need to get frustrated when you can achieve the speed to create and the capacity to dream at OWC.com. All right. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now. So um, my guest today is A.L. Levy joining us from URM. A.L., are you ready to, to kick into the second half here? Absolutely. Awesome, dude. Born ready. Uh, so we were talking about really awesome ways to think about adding the bass in your production, make sure that your production is in tune. You mentioned that you had yet another bass trick for us. Oh, well, it wasn't a bass trick. It was just a, a really helpful mixing trick. We love them. That uh, has, it blew my mind when I heard it. Maybe everybody else has 
already become familiar with it. But it's one of those that when um, a dude named Bo Burchell from the band Seosin, who's also a really great producer, he came on Nail the Mix in 2017 or 16. And he showed this trick and it was the first time I'd ever heard it and it was mind blowing. And uh, lots of people who we have had on Nail the Mix and on the podcast have mentioned that they use it because of that episode. So this is, this is one of those that kind of spread like wildfire because it's so effective. Love it. So I thought I would share it. This has to do with snare bleed. Um, we all know that when recording live drums, bleed on the snare is typically an issue, especially if you've got a loud hi-hat. And uh, sometimes when you, want, you EQ the live snare a certain way, uh, when you start to deal with that high end, um, you just start to dial in a lot of hat or uh, there's just a ton of bleed between the hits and it's just really annoying. Right. Um, you know, stuff that's old, sneaking into the snare mic as you EQ. Yeah. Yeah. Just age old problem. Right. So here's a really, really good way to deal with it. So step one is just dial the snare the way you want it. Right. EQ it how you want it get it sounding good. Then uh, duplicate the track. And on the duplicate, you insert a compressor at the top of the chain, just like a stock compressor, nothing special. Like the Pro Tool stock compressor will work just fine. Mm -hmm. um, so just to reiterate, you have everything duplicated, right? You have the exact same chain duplicated. However, on the new one, uh, you put the compressor before any of your processing and just put it fastest attack, fastest release ratio as high as possible. You're basically getting it to act like a limiter, but for some reason, and I don't know why this works better than using a limiter. So then uh, after the chain, uh, like in the last spot, add an EQ or a filter, high pass it mm -hmm. to 700 or 800. And then you flip the phase, okay? And then when you play them together, when you combine them, what you're doing is that you're phase canceling the top end, which is where a ton of that bleed is. But every time that the snare hits, uh, it ducks for a second, causing the phase cancel signal to duck, which causes it to no longer phase cancel the top end on your snare. Oh, so That's great, man. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. I love it. I love it. It's so, magic. So basically the hi-hats in the original snare bleed or in the original snare mic and then in this phase flipped ones those hi hats aren't really get they're they're both getting the same EQ and neither one of them is really getting compressed and they're both at about the same volume except yes. that now that you're flipping it they're just canceling each other out but right in that moment where the snare hits and you have what you really want uh, oh I should back up they're not both getting the same EQ the the phase flip is is everything above 700. Um, yes, yes, yes. Correct. But then when the snare hits, because of the limiter, the top end on that, you know, that phase flip track is sort of, there's nothing happening in that moment when the snare That's hits. Right. So, the, so the original snare with all that EQ speaks through the mix. Correct. That's cool, man. Badass trick. I can't wait to try that. I'm hanging up now. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, it's a, it, it's a great one. All right, rock stars. There you go. Number two. Damn, dude. How many takeaways are we going to have a first for here on this interview? Uh, hopefully the most ever. What do you, do you guys have a name for that particular one? Uh, not really. It's just this the badass snare gate trick. And by the way, you're right. That absolutely 100% is not a bass trick. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely not a bass trick. <laughs> All right, cool. I miss I missed called it. Um, so. Back up one moment. You talked about um, nail the mix uh, happening at a location. What does that mean? So you guys have this thing called nail the mix, where you can go learn how to mix heavy rock and heavy metals, um, and you guys really kill it. So rock stars, if you're if that's what you're down with, you definitely want to check this out. What are some of the things that happen in nail the mix, and what does it mean to go do a nail the mix in Florida, for example? Okay, so uh, let me just give. The overall is that the the name of my company is URM, Unstoppable Recording Machine. And like 
you said at the beginning, it's an online school for, for rock and metal producers. And we've got several programs and, um, and products, uh, things that we do, ranging from in-person events like the URM Summit to Nail the Mix. And then Nail the Mix is our flagship uh, program or product. And what it is, is it's a monthly, uh, it's a monthly program where every single month uh, we get a badass cream of the crop mixer uh, showing how he mixed a cream of the crop song by a cream of the crop artist. Now, when I say cream of the crop, I don't necessarily mean famous. Uh, I, because I feature people who are not necessarily always famous, but who I believe have something to show mm -hmm. all the way from. So people coming up all the way to, like you said, Tom Lord algae. Uh, but anyways, Tom's great. At the, at the beginning of the month, we will release the uh, raw multi-tracks uh, from the band. We license them from the labels and from the bands. Uh, they're the real thing. They're the same thing that the mixer got to work with on the real album. Uh, they're not covers. They're real. And uh, our students get to work on m making their own versions. Now, they're not allowed to post them or really put them in their own portfolio or anything. Like, that's against the rules. But we do, we do have like a, an online group where they can share it with each other mm -hmm. for feedback. Um, and uh, so they spend the entire month um, working on their own version of this song that has been released that oftentimes they really love. And at the end of the month, uh, we will do a live stream with the mixer. Uh, and we, we go to, I mean, sometimes we'll bring the mixer to us Oftentimes we'll go to the mixer, uh, just depending on the scenario. And we go everywhere, We've been to Australia, Sweden, uh, all over the place. So when I said I'm going to, was going to go to Florida to do Nail the Mix, that's where we were going to a studio and meeting up with the the mixer to shoot the live stream. Oh, These live streams cool. are long. They're like, you know, they, they've been up to 12 hours long. Like we really, really get into it. Uh, every... Once in a while, you'll have a mixer that just kind of unbypasses plugins and talks about what they did. Uh, but the grand majority are mixing from scratch, which uh, if, uh, if we have the scenario where the person is unbypassing plugins, like basically just showing their album mix, uh, I, I hammer them <laughs> like crazy to get every single thought process possible behind it. So it's not just like, oh, well, here I bumped 8K because it adds that uh, that high end I like. And then here I just did this. It's not, it's not like that. We go, yeah. we go super deep. Uh, and like I said, the majority are mixing from the ground up. And so you're, you're getting to watch this person really, really do it. And I'm sitting there hosting and asking questions the whole time. We take questions for the audience and, uh, Super awesome. And also there's a, you know, a mix poll every month. So every single month, people are allowed to submit their version to a poll that we do that uh, then the audience votes on the winner and the winner gets a sick ass prize. Like, um, oh, that's like awesome. a really nice tel microphone from Telefunk and uh, re really good gear. Like we've got like AMS Neve sponsoring uh an upcoming one. So it's, they're really, really good prizes. That's fantastic, man. That's very cool. So the, the nail the mix event is a live stream event where people can actually yes. participate over the internet all day long during the mix and everything. And yeah, but if you miss it, uh, you if you miss it and you're right? subscribed, yeah. you yeah. can watch it. Yeah. yeah. That's cool, man. That's awesome. Um, what are some other things that you've discovered from doing this are really good elements that, that make it a great place for learning? Uh, so one thing that is really, really important for me is that when, I always like to say that when you hit stop on our videos, that's when the learning actually begins. And the reason that that's so important to me was because I used to do online classes for a really cool company called Creative Live. Uh, when they started their audio program, my best friend, who 
actually is now director of operations at URM. I helped him start the audio channel and this was back in like 2013. And we started doing online mixing and recording classes. The problem for me was that as soon as the class was over, that's it, right? I mean, you could buy it and watch it, but there's so much more to learning how to do this stuff than just observing. Like mm-hmm. you got to interact, you got to get feedback. Like there's so you, much you gotta more do. to it. Yeah, you got to do. And, uh, and so we provide that. Uh, we have a huge community that uh, is the most supportive community you will ever find. And the community consists of the Nail the Mix guests, a bunch of like incredible mixers, producers, dudes in big bands, all the way to total beginners. And we have a zero trolling policy, no assholes. So everybody is cool to everybody and always helping each other out. And that's, I find that that's what really makes the big difference because it's one thing to just watch a tutorial, right? Um, It's another thing when you have access to an entire community that's helping you every step of the way. And then we have a bunch of other uh, ways to keep on learning. Like, um, because the thing about Nail the Mix is it's like a masterclass, right? Uh, You're watching the dude go from start to finish, but that doesn't mean that because you're watching Tom Lord Algae EQ a snare that you're suddenly going to understand everything about EQ, right? Right. They're, they're not, they're not, tutorials on specific techniques. They're somebody's process. So we have a bunch of other programs and, um, and products that delve into every one of those topics. So when you put it all together, uh, you can get really, really good. And the other thing that is so, so, so important is that I'm sure that you know this from uh, your own experiences and from all your podcast guests, but the number one factor in developing a music or recording career is your ability to hang out with people, socialize with people, network. It's uh, it's arguably more important than your actual skills. However, obviously I'm not discounting skills, but the reason I say that is because you could have the best skills in the world. And if you don't know how to, how to interact with people, it's not going to work for you at all. Whereas... Mm-hmm. People whose skills may not be the best of the best of the best, but who are excellent hangs, who have good emotional intelligence and provide tons of value to people, they tend to do better and they can learn, right? So the the skills part is teachable. The, um, the hanging out part is far more difficult. And so we provide a community that really focuses on those elements, um, what are some what are some features um, of the community aspect that might be that particularly work well or might be unique? Well, so we have chapters uh, worldwide. Um, for instance, that uh, I think we've got like seventy six of them now. They're everywhere: Tokyo to Sweden to L.A., Nashville. Like they are all over the place. And these chapters meet in real life on a regular basis. And so, nice. as you know, um, recording is a very isolated kind of task. Uh, I mean, you interact with the people you're working with, but it, unless you're in a city, I mean, you live in Nashville, so Nashville is one of those exceptions. But most places in the world, engineers don't really hang out with other engineers. They don't even know each other to begin with. And one of the reasons that I think places like Nashville and LA foster so many greats is because of the community aspect and the socializing and the, uh, the positive uh, competition that it breeds Yeah, where when you're just working in isolation, it's really, really hard to do. Plus also a bunch of gigs come from who, you know, so we provide that in real life, not just online, um, the opportunity for people to, meet their peers, meet their potential bosses, meet their potential clients. And it's not just students that hang out at these things. A lot of our mixers go to these. And uh, we have had several, several students who have gotten incredible gigs as a 
result of this. So that's, that's, that's cool. a big one. That's cool. Um, How do you manage, uh, uh, you know, administrating something like that? Do you, are you able through the community to sort of, um, find people who want to be the organizer for their local group and things like that? So let me just say, I have an incredible team, first of all. Yeah. Um, about. We've got about f- 15 people in URM. Uh, you know, it just started at the beginning with me, Joey, and Joel. Uh, but And I did most of the community stuff on my own for the first few years. But it's at this point, it's way too big for me to handle on my own. And there's there's way too much going on. So I have, uh, I need to say, I have incredible people working for us who really, really give a shit. Um, so there's that. I have great community leaders, um, great support people, just our team's awesome. That's cool. And, uh, and so they help organize this stuff, but we try to find a chapter captain for each town. Who, <laughs> I like the sound of that, a chapter captain. Yeah. I mean, you have to have somebody. Do they get you know, a hat with a, with an anchor on it or anything like that? Cause I, actually they do get a hat. Nice. <laughs> um, and a shirt and a mug and a mouse pad and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, there's, you, you have to find somebody who, who has it in them to, you know, to kind of be a leader and to want to get people together. Uh, and there tends to be one in each town. That's one or cool, two or three. That's and cool. so we, we rely on, we try to, we rely on them. And the thing is that these chapter captains, they're often very motivated people, right? And they're very good with other people. And a lot of these guys end up meeting, guys and girls end up, end up ascending to serious gigs as a result of that role or working for us um, as employees. So it's a, we have a system that kind of creates leaders and people who help basically propagate the whole thing. I love it, man. That's great. That's inspiring stuff. Um, Well, very cool. So let's see. um, Any other aspects of of, uh, URM and Nail the Mix that we didn't, we didn't touch on yet? The reason we started was because when I was learning how to record, there was basically zero info on how to do this in this style of music. Mm-hmm. There was nothing for us. Um, you, the traditional recording schools uh, offered jack shit when it came to heavier music. They just didn't take these styles of music seriously. And as a matter of fact, they still don't. Uh, there was nothing online. You had to basically hunt like crazy to find a tiny morsel of information and the learning curve was massive mm-hmm. and it really bothered me. Um, so there, there was that. And then if you combine that along with the fact that there was this time period where the music industry just felt like it was completely falling apart uh, around 2010, about 10 years after downloading started, it really seemed like the SIP, like the ship was sinking. Are we out of that period now? <laughs> yes, we're definitely out of that period. Um, absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of proof that we're out of that period, yeah. but, uh, a lot of people were leaving music. Um, and a lot, a lot of smart, talented people. And we were about 10 years into the digital revolution and people still hadn't quite taken to it or were using these digital tools in the wrong way. And especially in heavy music, it seemed like the bar was going down and down and down as far as quality goes, Mm -hmm. which to me seemed like, like death basically, because you had all these business factors to that were making the business harder to be in. Plus the quality is going down. Well, you know, what direction does that point to? That points to, this thing's not going to last very much longer. Uh, and I didn't put in 20 years to have the ground fall out from right. under me. Like we didn't learn how to do this to give up. Yeah, exactly. And I didn't, I didn't get into it also to be in an industry that puts out substandard garbage. Um, but with the fact that there were that many less real recording studios, uh, no real mentorship opportunities like there used to be felt like 
we had to step in. Now, now, just, even it, just, just, even if, oh, go sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, you guys have this wonderful um, video ad that you sent me for, <laughs> for Nail the Mix that reminded me of like an old Crazy Eddie TV commercial or something. And I, I just wanted to, <laughs> to uh, point out, I think, wasn't the correct pronunciation garbage in that video? Yeah, garbage. Garbage. Yeah. <laughs> Big pile of garbage. All right, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, that's is interrupt all you want. Uh, but I was just getting at that whether we make a huge impact or a small impact, the idea was to raise the bar and to help basically foster in the newer generation of producers coming in at a higher level than the previous generation to kind of stop that downward curve. And so I don't know what the impact is that we've had. Uh, I'd like to think that at least for our little neck of the woods, it's been super positive, but in my opinion, recording quality now is better than it's ever been. Uh, music is uh, experiencing a renaissance. Genre lines are blurred. There's even in pop, there's just very interesting artists that are like the biggest thing in the world, like Billie Eilish, for instance. Mm -hmm. Like we are in a good time period. Yeah. There's great bands. They're doing original things again. There's so many great producers now. Uh, digital technology has come such a long way to where that whole thing about it sounding sterile or not as good, that's been, that's been debunked now. Like, I, yeah, I get it. Yeah. If there was a time period where people were saying that plugins weren't that good or amp modelers weren't good and they were right. But I mean, it's been 20, 25 years. The technology has improved and you have so many mixers now who used to be all hardware who have gone all in the box. And I'm not discounting hardware. Hardware is awesome. But what I'm saying is we're in a very good time period right now. Yeah, well, so as, as an analogy to that, um, when I worked with Steve Albini up in Chicago, he made a comment about analog and he talked about how analog, you know, has long been, analog tape, for example, has long been at it, the, the peak of, of evolution because it had 50 years to evolve. And yep. now here we are, digital's had 50 years to evolve. So there you go. So now it makes sense that it's finally getting to the point where everything sounds great. Man, we did this one Nail the Mix uh, where we were in Australia. We worked with this guy named Forrester Savell, who is incredible, by the way. Uh, he's not the biggest name here, but uh, anyone who knows him knows that he's top tier. Absolutely. We're him and this band called Carnival, which I would say is the Australian tool. Again, they're not very big here. Carnival? Carnival. K-A-R-N-I-V-O-O-L. Okay. Like Carnival, but Carnival. Nice. Um, and uh, they, they're they a very interesting band. Um, he's a, not, well, at the time, he was a very analog kind of guy. And the studio that we went to was, was an SSL room with a ton of hardware. And he did the mix like 90% out of the box. But he moves really fast and he got done in like six hours and we had time to burn. So we we're like, well, why don't we do a shootout? We've got all the UAD versions of the same hardware, got the Waves versions. Why don't we try to dial these and see how close we can get them to the hardware? And uh, you could watch it. Got it indistinguishable. It sounded identical. Now, the thing that is key here is that the knobs were not set to the same place to get the same sound. So right. if you're taking a plug-in and you dial it exactly like the hardware, like same exact settings, it's not going to sound the same, right? So you have to dial the plug-ins to their own sweet spot relative to what you're putting through them. And it's not going to be the same as the hardware. And even... Hardware doesn't sound the same as other hardware. You'll have two versions of the same unit and set them the same. They're going to sound different yeah. in general. Yeah. So you have to kind of take that same approach with, uh, with plugins. But I have seen it over and over and over and over again that you can get the exact uh, same results quality-wise if, uh, if you apply the same types of exploratory methods and 
using your ears to go for what's good. One of the, yeah, I think one cool. of the biggest drawbacks that people have with plugins is that there's presets and the visual aspect of it, right? So people will watch a tutorial and then mimic the settings and not understand the thought process behind it and not use, not use the same approach as with hardware of just dialing until it sounds great. Uh, you have to do that part. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, in, in the rock world, uh, in my world, for example, um, you know, I'm familiar with the the Chad Blakes and the Andrew Sheps, um, you know, sort of educating us like, oh, you really can make, you'd hear stories initially like, wow, these guys are really using, it's in the box and it sounds great, you know. And I imagine that there must have been particular, you know, luminary mixers in the the metal world too that were starting to share that message initially and now here we are so it's pretty exciting that you can have a home studio and um you know you you still have to do the right things more important than ever you have to do the right things to get it to sound right but you can get it to sound great absolutely i mean the truth has always been that the source tone is everything, yeah, right? Yep. Uh, and that's just as true now as it's ever been. Uh, however, you're, you just have more tools now. Uh, you know, it's great to have tools that you can fix problems with, but at the end of the day, it can the, the fundamentals are the same. Yeah. Great yeah. source tone, great arrangement choices, great decisions equal a great result. If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you're going to need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics and Riga Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting colorations and distortions. This is my voice right now on the new Amethyst microphone. With Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring an expensive sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Amethyst microphone at jayzmic.com. During the height of record making, Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, Ardent Studios, and the New York City Record Plant all turned to one company to build their consoles. That company is now Spectra 1964, carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. The extremely stable, high-speed circuit design of the 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you cleaner, punchier, dynamic recordings. Spectra 1964 brings you the sound of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and so many more. Created by the missile engineers who are central in rolling out the systems that protected the free world for over half a century, Spectra 1964 literally brings rocket science to your studio. With the STX600 mic pre with built-in comp limiter, full-frequency passive BBDI, and C610 dedicated comp limiter, start making records that last a life at spectra1964.com. So let me jump in here and I want to see if I can ask you some questions about stuff that we would learn through through Nail the Mix, for example. Um, and I want to back up one step to the tuning issue with guitars again. So Rockstar, it's just a reminder, always have a tuner around so that you're you're just constantly checking in with your bass, your guitars, and tuning before you do stuff so that when you do capture that moment, it sounds great. But then the other level that you you mentioned really quickly was get your guitars set up. And I think sometimes that sounds like a throwaway phrase, but it's not. It's really oh, critical. No, it's definitely not a throwaway phrase. <laughs> you know, it's like that means you have to either learn how to set up a guitar really accurately yourself or you need to have somebody that really knows what they're doing that you can trust to do a great job so that everywhere you play on the neck of this instrument your guitar is still in tune because I see this happen all the time 
And if you don't mind, let's let's talk about guitars for just a minute. But sure. I see this all the time where somebody goes, I say, it's not not sounding in tune as a producer or an engineer. And and they're like, oh, hold on. And then they, you know, they might be playing halfway up the neck for most of what they're doing, but then they just turn on the tuner and they do the open string. They go ding, 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 ding. Ah, That's the wrong chord I'm playing, singing here. But, you know, it says it's in tune and then they play the chord again. How's that? And I'm like, sounds terrible, you know. (laughs) It's not there yet. Um, Yeah. You know, and it's just that reminder you have to, well, let me me put the question to you. What are some other ways to make sure that your guitar is playing in tune? First of all. Or tuning uh, it in the studio, for example. Well, you got to make sure that the guy's hands aren't the reason it's out of tune because you can have a perfectly tuned guitar that's perfectly set up and it still sound out of tune. You can tune it to the right chord even and it'll still be out and it's because the person's death gripping it. Uh, so that's that Evertune solves for that, but not, you know, not everybody's got Evertune. Oh, interesting. And so if you're if you're squashing the strings with your fingers, Evertune is actually adjusting the tuning of the strings at the same time to compensate. That's what yes, that's why it's a godsend. What a trip. Yeah, because that death grip is so real. Um, and no amount of setting up a guitar solves for that. So like I said, it can be perfectly set up, perfectly in tune. And you get a player who just squeezes too hard and it's gonna be out. Mm-hmm. So Evertune solves for that. So the first thing I would do, no matter what your scenario is, is make sure that you're, if you're the player, or just make sure the player isn't the reason that it's out of tune. Number one, above and beyond. Uh, number two, as far as getting guitar set up goes, and uh, we actually, ha- we do have um, guides on how to do this that are pretty pretty in detail. Uh, I suggest that anybody who's recording guitars buy a beater guitar and learn how to set that up. Don't start with your nice guitars because you could destroy them. Electric guitar. Um, Yeah, electric guitars. Uh, Don't just don't start with your nice ones because uh, you really could do permanent damage. Yeah. Um, So I would buy a beater guitar and uh, you don't have to watch our guide, but, uh, Learn how to do it because great guitar techs are not that common. I mean, maybe in some cities like Nashville and LA, there's quite a few, but unless you're on a big budget record where there can be a guitar tech on hand, uh, you, you may not always be able to have someone come in and do it. And I would not trust the people in the band to know how to do it. Yeah. Right. And the, and, and you know, the one guy at the local music store, he may, no. he may know a little bit about it. He may know some basics, but there's a lot. It's a lot deeper than that at, at times. That is not the solution. Um, t- taking it to Guitar Center to get set up is a bad idea. Okay, um, all right, I like it. Bold yeah, statement, it, but it's a true statement. I, I mean, I'm not saying that every single person who works there setting guitars up doesn't know what they're doing, but I will say that a whole lot of them don't know what they're doing or just they don't, they, it's not an environment where they can really tweak it for the scenario. So right. setting up guitars is not as simple as just setting the neck and the intonation and picking the right string gauges and good to go. It, you There's that, of course, mm-hmm. but then there's the finer details of getting it exactly right for the player, mm-hmm. uh, getting it exactly right for the register you're going to play in one I had a great guitar tech when I oh, when I was uh, working in the studio in Florida, and he would always ask me, "What's this going to be used for? It's going to be used for leads. It's going to be used for rhythms. Like what? What's the kind of stuff that's going to be played?" And we would set it up for that purpose specifically. And then uh, when it was time to do leads, uh, then we would we would do it all over again. So. Interesting. It's a, it, that's why you really should know how to do it because if you really want to do it right, it's you have to customize it as much as anything else in audio. As as you know, uh, presets are even if you're using presets, they're just a starting point. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's nothing in audio that's one size fits all. And when it comes to setting up guitars, the you know the basic techniques 
are the same, but the customization is everything. So yeah, I remember that's being, why you should know how being surprised taking my guitar in to get set up and learning about things like oh I, you know they talked about how the the height of the nut down at the bridge, if that was a little too high, then when I played the third fret up, I was having to bend the string too far to hit the fretboard and like all these little things where you're like, oh, I never even thought about that. Or, um, you know, the fact that certain frets get a little bit worn down where the string touches and that starts to affect the tuning across all the frets. And so that's why it really helps to have somebody who's, who knows what they're doing because they know how to look for all those little details. Yeah, absolutely. And hey, if you're not the type of person who's mechanically inclined and you're just not going to do it, um, fine. You know, mm -hmm. that's fine. It is what it is. But then find someone who is and make good friends with them and pay them well to to do your guitars. Now, let me ask you this question. Are you aware of whether or not some of the um, the higher end guitar techs, um, you know, whether it's Nashville or somewhere else, will let you, what, does it ever make sense to ship your instrument to them, get it set up and ship back? Or is that crazy? Uh, it's not a good idea in my experience and opinion because the moment that you ship it everything changes yeah. because of the the weather the unpredictable weather and yeah. environmental conditions that'll go through. even as i talk I use the word shipping that just sounds like danger for guitar um all right cool well so it's great to know that, that how important that is so when you i will say this i will describe this even just the basic elements of intonating even just knowing how to move the bridge back and forth and um, and possibly adjust the truss rod on the neck in the studio um, will take that guitar part you're trying to record from, man, why does this not feel right to like, damn, that sounds awesome. Absolutely. It's, it's crucial. And the more you know, the more dangerous you can be. And again, you don't have to be an expert. There are certain things that I won't do on guitars. Like I'll do the basics, but if it comes to like... Uh, you know, sanding down frets and stuff like that, I will always go to an expert. Yeah. Um, so it kind of looping back to know your strengths and know when to get somebody else. Uh, like I was talking about originally when I would hire external mixers to do my band, know what you, know what you actually suck at and uh, get people to help you. That's, uh, it, I don't know any producers that are awesome or really anybody in the world of music, who's actually a lone wolf. Uh, right. It, great music and great productions are made by teams of people. I agree. It can be small teams or big teams, but man, the, the myth of a lone wolf, I think is more of a PR thing than anything else. Um, and it might be a danger zone for trying to create great art. Well, you can really destroy your guitars. <laughs> so that's a, uh, and not just that, there's a, there's a learning curve to all of this, right? So if there's an element that you're not very good at where you might actually hurt the project and either by just hurting the quality or breaking the zone, the creative zone, mm -hmm. by taking too much time to do something, mm -hmm. that's not good. Yeah. You, and you shouldn't be learning how to do that stuff while you're on a project should be doing that on your own time so that when you're in the project, it can be all work and all productivity. Uh, so anyways, I, I would just, for instance, with drums, I know how to tune, but I'm not that great at it. And so whenever I'd record drums, I would always bring in a drum tech, uh, a dude named Matt Brown uh, in Florida. And even if the band didn't have a good budget, I'd just pay for it myself because it was more worth it for me to have the drums perfectly in tune, exactly right for the, for the situation so that I could have a great result than it was to save the few hundred dollars and have something kind of crappy. So That's a great it, takeaway. Yeah, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, you should learn how to do it too. Because you don't usually save that few hundred bucks because you end up, you know, spending like three times as much of that in your own personal time, just trying to get it to sound right later. Exactly right. Um, and let's be real. The one thing 
that matters more than anything else at the end of the day is the quality of your work. And you're only as good as your work. I mean, I did say earlier that networking is more important than skills to some degree. But at the end of the day, if you want people to hire you, uh, your work has to be great. No amount of advertising or marketing is going to do that for you. No amount of networking is going to actually get you the high-end gigs and the, the ones you really want uh, without, without there being some sonic track record of proof that you're the right person. And by saving that, those $300 on, uh, on your drums, uh, you're basically hurting yourself in the long run. So I would look at it all like an investment in your own future to do whatever's in your power to get things sounding as good as they possibly, possibly can. That's interesting. Again, but the, thing, the thing that hire, gets people hired is word of mouth and portfolios. And well, it's, it's interesting because thinking about what you're saying too, it's a reminder that even if you might find yourself in a position where to get this, you know, today's project done, you're actually going to make um, uh, just about nothing on it. You might decide it's more valuable to me to make nothing today putting out something that really sounds great because it's going to bring a project along later that that will um, you know help me earn real income with what I want to do because the quality of what I'm doing today sounds so much better. I completely agree. That's a very interesting topic that you're bringing up and I have a lot of thoughts on it. Um, I always advise people to play the long game when it comes to music and audio, really anything in life that's worth doing is going to take a while uh, if it involves skills and knowing people. So always be playing the long game and be thinking about how the decisions that you're making now will come into play later. And for example, um, lots of the biggest things that I've ever done, biggest projects I've landed, like whether it's mixing something really cool or, uh, you know, getting someone incredible on Nail the Mix, whatever, or, you know, getting my band signed to a major label. Like all of it took a long time and it took years and years of making the right moves over and over and over and over again. And uh, you have to be playing the long game. And sometimes giving up money uh, in order to learn something or have the opportunity to work on something that will propel you further is the right move. And the reason that I have a really strong opinion about this and I wanted to talk about it is because I have seen a lot of really famous mixers that are incredible talk shit about working for free online. Like uh, they'll be, they'll say like, know your own worth should always charge. I would never do anything for free. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting there thinking, well, you're 55 years old. You're a multimillionaire. You've been a multimillionaire for about 25 years. And frankly, you don't know what it's like out there for people first starting. And you forgot what it's like to struggle. Mm -hmm. And I still think you're a genius, but uh, you no one's going to ask you to work for free anyways. So it doesn't even count. So because and I'm saying this because I've had lots of students be like, well, this guy who you know has like 19 Grammys says, don't work for free. It's like, well, yeah, that guy doesn't have to work for free. Uh, why would anyone ask that guy to work for free? He's so-and-so. When you're first starting out, you have no market value. That, that is just the truth. You might be awesome. You might have developed your skills in secret and become world-class, but to the market, you are valueless. And until you prove that value... Uh, whether that is to a potential mentor who will then hire you, whether it is to record labels who want to hire you to, you know, mix lots of their bands, whether it's to bands who will hire you, until you've proven that value, you have none. And you got to do whatever you can in order to establish that. And that value comes through your track record and who you know and what they think of you. And if nobody's coming to you and you don't have an opportunity to work on stuff, how are you going to grow 
How are you going to create a track record? Yeah. It has it going to happen. Yeah. And on top of that, how are you going to learn unless you're doing this all the time? And if nobody's coming to you, where are you going to get those opportunities to learn? And then on top of that, if uh, you want to get mentored by somebody, if you want somebody who's at the top of their game to invest time in you when you have no value, what, uh, what's in it for them? Why should they pay you? Well, it's, and, it's like going to school. I mean, you, you know, yep. everybody understands the idea of, oh, you know, maybe you're going to go to college. So you're going to go pay for an education, learn something, and then you'll go out there and try and work in whatever field you want to do. Um, the cool thing about what you're talking about too, is just that reminder of uh, maybe, maybe your schooling isn't in a school. Maybe it's, maybe it's through something like URM or maybe it's through um, just giving yourself opportunities to be working for people and making records so you can put better and better stuff out there. And that's what you're paying for instead of a tuition. Um, or maybe you're taking it to the next level, like you said, and you said, your tuition is the fact that you're actually hiring a great drum tech to come set up the drums or great musicians to come play on your own records so that you can put out something that's really high quality. Absolutely. Uh, and let me just say that I really do believe in URM, but I will be the first person to tell you and all of us will be the first people to tell you that just doing URM is not enough. Like we really do believe that we stand behind everything that I said before about providing the connections and the information and all that. But if you're not out there actually doing the work, it is not going to work for you. It doesn't matter what school you went to. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't. You have to put, you have to log the hours. Um, yeah. And, and you're not going to get paid at first. That's just the way it is. And this this topic also is something I'm passionate about because I've seen some people get really irate about free internships. And I know that in some places they're illegal now, which I think really hurts people. Uh, it, it's not exploitation to do a free internship. Um, no. I'm, because, well, have you, have you seen... Have you seen these laws that are coming out in certain places? No, where- no, but Na- Nashville has a law that says, uh, or Tennessee, that you know you have to be in a school program in order to be an intern, which I, I, I think that is a double-edged sword because it's like, eh, I can see maybe what you're trying to do there, but really all that also says is that um, all the studios that want to offer internships for students who want to learn how to do this stuff, the studios become the unpaid teachers, basically. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Why should they put the time into you? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Also, what that does is it only gives the opportunity to the people who can afford these recording schools. Right. And recording schools are so fucking overpriced. And man... So when I had the studio in Florida, I would get hit up by a really big recording school to take their interns every single quarter. And the, they had people on staff who would just contact studios and try to get them to take interns. And man, these people that they sent me were the most useless interns around as compared to people that I met independently who were just very, very driven. Right. Uh, so I have a thing about the school program internships. I, I'm sure that some people have created great careers off of it, but by and large, the people that I've met through those are not worth working with, which was costing me money to even deal with them in the first place. And then on top of that, the school internships are for a very limited amount of time, right? So three months and you get the credit, then it's over. How? How is that supposed to work? I think an internship that leads to getting hired as an assistant or anything real could sometimes last a year or two. How are, how are you going to make any real progress in three months? Right, right, yeah. Well, it's a challenge. I mean, I, I really enjoy uh, interacting with interns here, and I've done it for years. But I've also been sometimes an exception to the rule because I'm willing to stumble through 
the challenges of of interacting with some that know what they're doing and some that don't know what they're doing at all. And, you know, I figured out some ways to to work with them well. Um, but I just personally, like you, I just love the 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 teaching and the interaction and the helping the next generation learn stuff. But I'm I'm also struck by, you know, seeing people come out of school systems and it's like they're not being taught how to record an instrument necessarily. They're being taught that music is uh, program something on a laptop and set up one vocal mic and go, you know, and that's it. Um, so I think it's really I important mean, that we create opportunities for for new students to learn how to keep the art of recording going. But there is a validity to a laptop and a microphone if uh, you have very, very definite or defined artistic intentions mm -hmm. and you know exactly what you're doing, right? Um, most of the, or all of the Billie Eilish stuff was recorded in a home studio. I know it was mixed, but in a real facility, but there's, there's lots of talented people who work off of laptops, yeah. but I know exactly what you're saying. The thing that I have against the recording schools is that I feel that they don't necessarily focus on hireable skills. So they're not necessarily focusing on the art of recording so much. They're also not focusing on the most hireable skills. In my opinion, the most hireable skills are editing mm -hmm. tasks mm -hmm. and DAW operation, mm -hmm. things like that. The, the technical stuff that a producer who's been around for a long time, who's super busy, doesn't want to do anymore mm -hmm. because they don't have the time for it. And they have bigger picture stuff to be worrying about. Like, is the song good? Right. So they can't be sitting there editing all the drums um, or tuning all the vocals they always hire other people to do it. And that right there is, in my opinion, those are the most hireable skills. And the interns that I've gotten from schools never know how to do that stuff. And that is a double-edged sword because you, they can cut, if they already know how to do that stuff, they may um, have learned some bad habits or not want to do it the way that you need them to do mm -hmm. it. But at the same time, if they've got no background at all in those skills, then what are they doing at that school? Like that is the most important stuff. It would be hard to describe in one sentence what gives records a legendary sound, but it would be easy to describe in three letters, API. For more than 50 years, API Audio has created large format consoles for world-class studios. Famous for co-founder Saul Walker's circuit designs and the original 2520 op amp, the sound of API consoles is the sound of great music. API now brings that legendary sound to your home studio with The Box, a small format console featuring the famous API circuitry that is the perfect analog addition for your digital studio. The Box gives you eight recording channels on the left with built-in mic pre's, high-pass filters, direct inputs and custom loadable 500 module slots, and 16 summing channels on the right, or mix using all 24 channels, including aug sends, inserts, and silky smooth faders, feeding a master section with classic API compression, switchable monitor sends, and a pro talkback switch, and you've just upgraded your studio to legend status with The Box from apiaudio.com. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer and a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. Um, if I was to put you on the spot and just say, are there, you know, a couple of points about editing drums that we can talk about right now that are important for people to be aware of? Would that be a fair question? Sure. Um, hands win when it comes to metal. <laughs> that's uh, that's the biggest one. So I love that. I don't even know what that means, but I love, um, that's a great. I'm writing that down right now. Hands win. Okay. So what it means is that uh, 
the kick drum in metal recording is kind of a debatable topic. Debatable in that you don't necessarily even have to really use one. And that's not because the drummer's not good, but it's because they cause all kinds of potential problems in the mix um, and also in the editing process. Uh, just because if you have basically a low cannon going off at 260 BPM, 16th notes the entire time, it makes it really hard to dial rooms and overheads properly. Uh, so regardless of the performance aspect, there's, there's some reasons for why a real kick drum can be, can be a real hindrance. Now, I will say that when you have a great drummer who knows exactly what they're doing and they play great, then sure, go for it. But there's also the issue that um, lots of times parts change in the studio. And when you have something as intricate and dominating as a metal kick drum, if you need to change it, uh, then what? You right. want to take away kick drums uh, and change the pattern completely like a super intricate 16th note pattern with a bunch of rests and like changing subdivisions, then what? Uh, then you're going to get stuck in a weird situation. Then also, even the best drummers in the world have bad days. And like I said about metal drumming, it's an Olympic feat. Like that playing double bass at these speeds is hard to do. Especially when you're asking them to do a bunch of takes. Yeah, exactly. And so, again, even some of the best in the world are not going to have good days. And then what? Then you have these 16th notes that are in every single mic that are out of time. And what you're going to, are you going to cut it up on every 16th note? That's insanity. And then there's also the issue that uh, the, the way a drummer plays, like I said before, the most important element in a the drum recording is the drummer and obviously how the drummer is playing. And when they have to do this high endurance stuff, like the fast double bass, oftentimes they will focus on the feet and then not focus so much on how they're playing the hands. And one of the cool things that you can do is say, all right, don't play kicks here. Just bash the fuck out of this part. And then, program the kicks and that that's a really great method or so what would you do music. would you just put up some sort of dummy head in front of the kick drum where they still hit it but they're just not it's just not making depends. any sound well no well see the thing is it totally it depends it, right it's triggered, yeah. well here's the thing if the issue is that the drummer uh, over focuses on his lower half and then starts uh, kind of just I think that's a problem for a lot out. of guys yeah, but <laughs> sorry, that was a do that. little joke there. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it can be, but um, it, but for real though, if even if you're using a trigger pad, um, and there's no audible kick drum in the room, if they're focusing on their feet too much, uh, they can then start playing kind of wimpy with their hands. So that doesn't solve for that. Wow. I hate wimpy However, hands. I hate wimpy hands in the drums, dude. It's the worst. And that's when you have to start sampling things like crazy and replacing them. So if you want a natural, as natural as possible of a drum sound, then you need to make sure the performance is as awesome as possible. We, and if they're way too focused on fast double bass, it's arguable whether or not you're going to get the performance you need out of the hands. And because metal kick drums are primarily sample based anyways in the way they sound in the end, what difference does it make? Now, sometimes you get drummers who are really awesome and they can play all of that stuff. However, then you have the issue of, do you really want all those bass drums and all the room mics and the overheads? Yeah. And the answer is oftentimes no. With the faster bands, the answer is oftentimes no. So then, yeah, use a kick pad. Um, now, That's I will great. say that if you're, if you're going to do that, you need to give the drummer ample warning. You don't just spring it on them in the studio. Oftentimes I would, I would send it to them a couple months in advance so that they could practice on it or build in enough time so that they can get used to it because it's going to be different than what they're used to. 
Some drummers just won't be able to do it. So again, like we said, there's no one size fits all solution to this stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, to answer the question on hands, when? <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's what a, a cool takeaway. Answer. That's number three for the podcast rock stars right there. I think there's more than just three, but that's three really distinct, you know, what you can do and you've never tried before in the studio takeaways. So substitute the kick drum. Even in rock, even in the this, this stuff that I might do, indie, pop, whatever, um, anything where you've got a four on the floor kick drum or you've got a fill where the kick is reinforcing the downbeats of, you know, um, of a one bar, you know, four and a snare fill, you, as soon as you start trying to double check the timing or line up or tighten some of the drums, you you quickly discover you're like, oh crap, the kick and the snare aren't landing together at the same time, and then you're like you're like, which one do I want to put towards the grid and tighten up the snare or the kick? So I like your your takeaway of hands win and just don't have a kick in there competing if you can avoid it if it's going to be a problem. Yeah. And again, you can't always do that. And, but there's, sometimes there's a compromise. Like for instance, it's supposed to be 16th notes on this part, but, but the dude just won't hit as hard if he's doing 16th notes. But at the same time, he's not willing to not use a kick drum. Yeah. It's, it happens. I mean, <laughs> why not just do eighth notes? Yeah. Just do something so that he can actually be playing if he needs that. But just, you know, so it goes all the way from no kick drums at all to full kick drums all the time uh, and everything in between. But just don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to make requests. Like, let's just not play the kicks on this part. Yeah. And or I, why don't you just hit on the down, like on the one and the three or something. I can already picture, you know, the the school trained engineer who's trying to make you sound like Pearl Jam and Soundgarden back in the 90s, not knowing that trick. Yeah, that's, dude, it's a big one. It's it's a big one. It's, you also, man, finding drummers who can actually play this stuff. <laughs> that's also, that's also a trick in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah, I bet uh, really good drummers in your world get a lot of calls to come play on records. Yeah, they're uh, they are in high demand because it's so rare. And I'll say, in the it's a lot better now than it's ever been. Like in the '90s and early 2000s, just finding a drummer who could play to a click was like finding a diamond. Mm-hmm. Uh, now everybody plays to a click. Um, I remember in the early days saying, "I, I want to." Can we record this to a click? And they'd get really, really weird. Um, that doesn't really happen so much anymore. Now, it, not recording to a click is an artistic decision. Right. Which is fine. I think if it's intentional, that's great. But if you're not doing it because the drummer's afraid of it, that's that's a different story. Yeah. Um, so let, let's see if we can get a takeaway there. If you're working with the band and the drummer is going to have to learn how to play with a click more, is there a process in pre-production where you've found that you've been able to get a drummer ready for the session that way? I try to interact with the bands as early as possible. Um, So I really, really don't believe in springing things on people that require them to improve just like improve their skills overnight because that doesn't work. Right. Um, like you're not going to turn somebody from a bad singer into a good singer in the studio. You're not going to turn them from a bad drummer into a good drummer in the studio. You might get the best out of them for their skill set at the moment, but you're not going to transform them. So if you need them to pick up a skill that, uh, that they don't currently have, the best thing is to communicate with them as far in advance as you possibly can several months and emphasize the importance of it. Now, whether or not they're actually going to listen to you and practice to a click and practice hitting hard and space out their symbols and all that stuff is anybody's guess, but you can at least try to get them to do that stuff. Why don't you go ahead and clarify space out their symbols? Okay. So, um, like I said, I think the everybody agrees that for styles of music that involve live drums, that the best scenario is 
a great drummer in a great room, as natural as possible, right? That's the ideal. Uh, only using samples for reinforcement. But what needs to happen in order for that is that the recording is good enough to, to, to use. Um, and if the symbols are too low, too close together, uh, you're going to have lots of bleed issues with, uh, with your snare, which I know we talked about how to deal with that, but in the toms, you're going to have bleed issues. And just keep in mind that these metal drummers will do these crazy complex fills where they're like doing like three hits on a tom and then splash and then a tom in China and then more toms and just like going like crazy. And it becomes really, really hard to edit that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like they kind of got to nail it. And if everything is bleeding all over everything else and you have stuff that's, uh, that's occurring that quickly, then a lot of these tricks don't work the same way. And then you end up having to resort to just sampling everything because every time you hear the toms go by, you get this weird blast of high end from symbols that are ringing that you, that bled in, that got EQ'd into them. And so if the drummer physically raises their symbols as high as possible, within, within reason, of course, you still got to be able to play, but the further away that the symbols are from the shells, the better. And also the easier it is to mic everything. It's just better for everyone. But again, that's not something that a lot of drummers will be comfortable with if you just spring it on them yeah. in the moment. They have to learn how to move their arm a lot farther now to play the same part. Yeah, exactly. And so if they, if they have six months to practice that way, that's awesome. If they have an hour, that's not so that's awesome. That's not so awesome. But you can encourage them, Rockstars. Just remind them that they will become more muscly and built from all that movement. So it'll be a good thing. Mm -hmm. They'll look much Absolutely. better on stage. <laughs> One thing that I would do is uh, have them send me pictures of their setup when we were first in conversations so I can, from multiple angles, so I can judge the relative heights and whether or not it's a convoluted mess or not. And then just make suggestions like, okay, uh, your, your, uh, your crashes, why don't you raise them a foot? See what happens. That China, try to move it out just six inches. See what happens. Yeah. Well, rock stars, I also want to encourage you as a takeaway from listening to AL talk about this stuff and the way that you are. Um, so you're sort of calm and you really lay out the explanation piece by piece and you don't rush through it. I think that same strategy used towards explaining to the band that you're producing, you know, why it is that you would should try moving your symbols and stuff instead of just sort of being a tyrant and just being like, you got to move that symbol. You know, that doesn't get you the result in the same way that helping recruit the musicians to understand what these challenges are and why we're all in a mission together to get the very best sound for this record is. So I think that's a that's a great takeaway there. As You're well. absolutely right. The uh, it, when you bring up ideas like these that require somebody to go out of their comfort zone, uh, if you approach it in a way that turns it into an adversarial type of relationship, you're only hurting the project. And granted, there are some people who need a strong leader, like so the producer has to know how to how to read the people that they're working with and understand like who's very sensitive and needs soft encouragement, who needs a taskmaster. And that's one thing, but being a tyrant and turning it adversarial is a whole other thing. And if you're asking people, I mean, if you're telling people to do things that take them out of their comfort zone and you're not helping them understand the bigger picture, um, you're not, like you said, recruiting them. You're just hurting the project. Everything is better if the goals for the project are, you know, in agreement. Everyone's on the same page. Because then if everyone's on the same page and there's a bigger picture that everyone understands is bigger than their own temporary comfort, then uh, they'll make sacrifices. Yeah. They'll, they'll do what's needed. Yeah, that's great. 
Do you feel like the time you spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here are just some of the things students are saying about the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process I have ever been a part of. That was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years watching and picking up tips along the way condensed into a six to seven hour lesson. David P. Thanks for a great session, dude. Just when I needed the inspiration. John F. A true feat of greatness. It was really life-changing and worth way more than I paid. Mark R. I've literally watched it two times at length, taken a plethora of notes, then combed back over some sections even more. You guys really knocked it out of the park on this one, and it was so incredibly eye-opening and useful immediately. What else can I say? Shane J. Amazing masterclass with Craig Alvin. My biggest takeaway was the concept of adding a subtle combination of distortion and compression to achieve a buttery coat cohesion in the sound, but there is so much more. Steve K. Listen, I appreciate you listening to this podcast, and I know you're trying to make your best record ever. But when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy-winning quality, then you're ready for UltimateMixingMasterclass.com. Well, let me, let me uh, hit you with one more question before we kind of close out. Um, this one is related to something you said a moment ago as well. You talked about um, learning skills that are useful once you leave school. So one, the other one was tuning vocals. So is there any takeaway you want to share with us about the process of tuning vocals that, that would be helpful? Yes. Uh, it's only going to take you so far if, uh, if the singer can't do it. Yeah. Um, which I think sounds pretty obvious, but it's important to know what the software is able to do and what it's not able to do. What is the software? What, what's, what are some of the software options that we should even be considering and aware of? I think you should know both Melodyne and Autotune. Awesome. You should know both because they do different things um, and they both have their strengths. Like for instance, Autotune is great with with singing, but uh, if you have a singer that's kind of raspy and uh, pitches his screams or something, and this is true in rock too, autotune doesn't really play too well with that. However, Melodyne is fantastic for it. So they, you should know both of them. Yeah. Also, if you're working under a producer, they may have specific requirements for each one. So the dudes that I know that are great at this stuff know both. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, there's weird stigma out there about tuning vocals because of some artists and producers who have used the software technically incorrectly to create an artistic effect that suddenly everybody decided that that's what tuning sounds like. Right. Um, like the T-Pain thing or the share thing. It, suddenly, because they got because they put out a song or a sound that got famous using the tool, the uninitiated big began to think that using those tools will make you sound that way. When in fact, that was just an artistic decision. And that is actually the sound of the software being pinned. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's not actually what, what tuned vocals are quote unquote supposed to sound like. Right. And, right. You should definitely understand what the limits are of what the software can do and still sound transparent because really well-tuned vocals, you shouldn't even be able to tell that they're tuned. If you can hear that they're tuned, there's a problem. And what that requires is that the singer be uh, within a range, uh, within an acceptable range. And so... Uh, if you're recording the vocalist, 
if you don't understand what's workable and what's not, you could be throwing away really, really good takes that could just be fixed, or you could be letting stuff get through quality control that is going to sound totally tuned. And, uh, and if that's not what you're going for, then that's not good. So definitely put in the time to understand what it is that the software can and can't do so that you're making the right decisions. It's the same as with editing drums. There's some stuff that's just not editable. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And yeah. You can't, it's just because the tools are powerful doesn't mean that everything can be edited to sound great. There, there is a, there's a line between where something is just too shitty. Right. So really, really need to understand what that and is. And that's, that's practice and that's learning it and trying it and running into stuff. I mean, you know, for example, one, one, two details I, I noticed with tuning, uh, using Melodyne, sometimes the kind of, sh sh those, these kind of like non note parts of a lyric that start or end a word can get freaked out sounding when they get pitched. And those yeah. are things you run into. Another is um, if there's the sound of the room, if you sing the word and then you hear a little bit of the natural echo and decay of the room that the voice is in, that could also end up sounding possibly weird when it gets tuned. So yeah. you just have to run into all those things. Totally. Something that's really cool to do, actually, um, if uh, you don't want it to sound perfect, however you want it to sound modern and in tune um, is to, uh, to record, you know, the main and the double and then tune the hell out of the main and leave the double somewhat untouched uh, and then blend them together. That, that uh, provided of course, that it's within an acceptable range. Right. If, if the singer is half steps off or, even close to half steps off, then that's not going to work. But if it's a pretty good singer, uh, that that's a really, really good way to get it up to modern standard, but also real sounding. Uh, and that's all actually a really good trick uh, for mixing. If you take that same idea, if you take uh, one, uh, one of the vocals and kind of just you know, process it with like compression or whatever, limiting and EQ, but basically dry and uninteresting. And then you take the double and you just, you go nuts with it. Mm -hmm. Nuts. Like all the delay and reverb and distortion and everything you could ever want. And then you blend those two together. That, that tends to do really nice things too. Yeah. Uh, another takeaway I've gotten is... If you tune, if you're using Melodyne, for example, and you tune the lead vocal and then you go in and tune the double as well and you treat them both similarly, you can start hearing these weird, like things start sounding laser beamy in the tone or something. And it's it's almost like you you played a synth sound and then you played the same synth sound and doubled it and it doesn't, it sounds weird, you know? And I think it's because the you're you're asking this tuning software to sort of generate a tone for you and then generate it again so it doesn't sound like a double because they sound too close. Yeah, you know? totally. That's That happens. And another thing, and we didn't mention this, but um, the other thing that you should learn how to do is uh, revoice uh, or any sort of time correction that's involved because when you start doubling, tripling, quadrupling vocals, especially with stuff that's pattern heavy, uh, they have to be on or it's going to, it's not going to sound like one person. We're talking about the timing, I mean, it, it, the phrasing, the, and the timing. timing yes. Yeah. yeah. It, I mean, maybe that's the artistic intent for it to not to sound like one person, but oftentimes it's supposed to sound like one person, but you double and you triple and quadruple it for, because, uh, because you want the thickness, but how do you get that? intricate pattern to sound like one person while well, you fix the timing. And Revoice Pro is a fantastic piece of software that, uh, that I think everybody who records or edits vocals should know how to use. It will work 85% of the time. However, 
for the other 15% of the time, um, it, time stretching and uh, those types of tools should be, uh, should have those under your fingers yeah, as well. That's cool. I actually haven't used Revoice. Um, I tend to do any alignment just within Melodyne if I'm doing it. But, uh, but um, Vocaline is another one that I remember using. Vo- well, Vocaline, Vocaline is the original version of Revoice. Um, okay. It's made by the same people. And Vocaline, I actually like Vocaline better, but it it's not as friendly with newer operating systems and stuff. So Revoice, re- if you, a lot of people have older systems and just never, never upgrade. Yeah. So if you have an older system, Vocaline is the way to go. Um, but Revoice does essentially the same thing. The thing about it is, uh, I think that when you get the original, then the manual time correction is the way to go because you want to get, you don't want the computer to do the thinking for you, in my opinion. It should be as in, I think one of the themes that we've covered a lot today is intentionality. I think that uh, if you're correcting the timing on a vocal, like really it should be as intentional as possible because it's not as simple as just putting it to the grid. Sometimes vocals need to be behind the beat or ahead of the yeah. beat or yeah. moving around or whatever it is. So manually get it the way you want it. But then when it comes to the doubles and all that stuff, that's where revoice or vocal line come in really, really handy so that you don't have to do the work all over again, recreate all those little nuances. It'll just align the shit for you. That's great, man. I love that, dude. Well, dude, these have been some really, really cool takeaways. And um, I love having you here on the podcast. It's been a pleasure just hanging out with you, man, and and hearing the way you break it all down. Um, Let me hit you with one closeout question. This is when I ask all my guests. Um, It's it's a hypothetical question, but we're going to take the way back studio machine and you get to go back in time and find young Al. Uh, maybe, you're, maybe you're playing guitar at 13 and wanting to be in a rock band, or maybe you're at Berkeley and just thinking about how you make your first recordings. But um, if you could go back in time and give yourself one bit of advice and say, listen, young dude, um, your hair is not long yet, but here is the single most important thing you're going to need to know to be a rock star of the recording studio yourself one day. What, what advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Uh, well, there's two things. Number one, uh, if you have a problem, uh, with people as in like, maybe you have an uh, issue with authority, which is, uh, very common in music. <laughs> that might even get or, you started in music. Yeah, exactly. So, but that's what I'm saying. If you have like an issue with authority or you're an introvert, which is also very common, um, I, I'm a total introvert, then you have to learn how to put that shit aside and get along with people um, and learn how to socialize, learn how to hang and learn how to read people because one of the, one of the biggest killers of careers is someone that weirds other people out or the intern who goes to the studio and speaks out of turn, uh, makes the artist feel uncomfortable, and then they never get called. <laughs> um, I've, I've had those, and I may have even been those. I think we all have. And because, because artists tend to be the introverted type, uh, it's very possible they don't have the, the practice of dealing with people. Um, yeah. Your emotional intelligence is so important in this game. And it's something that you can develop by working on it. And I would urge you to get out of your comfort zone when it comes to dealing with people. And that comes down to things like hygiene. Uh, You know, if you have a history of depression, which a lot of artists do, that's why I'm saying it, uh, your hygiene might not be best. Your appearance might not be best. Those things really, really matter. Um, You might think they don't matter because music first, but it matters because if someone's going to hire you, they need to trust you and they need to feel comfortable with the decision to that investing in you, whether they're investing time or money. And if you're not together as a person, they're not going to feel comfortable with that. And 
you're ba- basically killing the opportunity right there. They certainly won't recommend you to other people. And one of the biggest ways to move forward is through word of mouth. If the word of mouth is the dude smells bad, has bad breath and says weird shit, always talking about conspiracy theories um, or just talks out of turn or mm-hmm. makes the artist feel uncomfortable, then it doesn't matter how good you are. So that's number one. And then the other thing I would say is do whatever you can do to get as good as possible. <laughs> like I know that that sounds super obvious, but man, a lot of people spend more time looking up plugins, buying new gear, like arguing about Mac versus PC, Cubase versus Pro Tools than actually doing the work. And they do things that um, are, they feel like are productive. Like for instance, a lot of people feel like writing emails is a productive thing to do, uh, which is, it's more of a maintenance task. Right. It's something necessary, but you're not really being productive by clearing your email box. But so people will do busy work and trick themselves into thinking that they're being productive. And you got to be really honest with yourself and identify what behaviors you have that are basically diluting you into uh, thinking that you're moving forward when in reality you're not and purge those behaviors or at least limit them. I'm not saying never watch Netflix. I actually binged the entire season of Ozark uh, three in one night, but that's after three <laughs> weeks of not watching Netflix at all. Now, what about, um, come on, man, what about Lily Hammer? Didn't you just eat that up for the Nor- whole Norwegian vibe, you know, with the uh, the black metal scene and everything? I didn't see. Oh, that. you haven't what seen Lillehammer? It's a great Netflix uh, series. It's some years ago, but it takes place all in Norway. No, I never. You, even you'll heard love of it. it. You'll love it. I'll, ch- I'll check it I'm, out. I'm but pretty sure they have some uh, some Norwegian, you know, metal bands referenced in there. I guarantee they do. Though those bands are uh, are pretty well known over there. Um, like some of them are like the biggest bands in the country. Demu Borgir. But, but yeah, I like, again, I'm not saying don't watch Netflix or anything. I'm not saying don't write emails or don't get new, new plugins. Just realize what you're doing. And back to the intentionality thing. If you, if you think that getting a new plugin is making you better, you're wrong. So quit the delusional behavior. Those are the two things that That's I would great. tell people starting out. That's great. I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, say back two takeaways for me. So on the first one, I always stash underarm deo. And I can't, I can't offer any hygiene tips for the girls. Sorry, ladies. But for the guys, I always stash underarm deodorant in the bathroom here in the studio. And mouthwash is a good thing to have around because it's those moments where you get surprised by yourself that you got to have a solution to. And then, Absolutely. And then um, for me knowing the difference between busy work and productive is uh, productive. I usually have a measurable goal. And if I go work at work on that thing and I get closer, or I accomplish that particular goal that might often be a, um, a sign that I was working on something that, that was important to me. And I'm like a bigger picture goal, like a goal for this quarter or a goal for the next couple of weeks or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about goals, uh, I just, one thing that I like to always keep in mind um, is that and I kind of live by this, but it's very easy to overestimate what you can get done in a year and underestimate what you can get done in five. So um, yeah. just it, it to realize that helps keep goals in perspective because this shit takes a long time. Um, and a lot of people myself included, are impatient. They want it all now. And it's, and especially when people are making New Year's resolutions or setting goals, they'll, they'll go nuts with what they think they can do in one year and then set themselves up for failure and disappointment because they won't accomplish it and will get bummed out and unmotivated. But if you look at it more through a five-year Zoom, then the story changes. I think that's great, man. Uh, speaking of five years, I think as we do this interview, both you and I 
started our, our podcast about five years ago. When did you start yours? 2015. Same here, March, March 15, Yeah, you, you beat me by a few months. And I think I started right, right in the middle of that summer. And when I began it, I mean, here we are now, and I've done over 250 interviews, as, as have you, and I'm having this amazing conversation with you. And we have an even more amazing group of people, you, the rock stars, who are listening to this right now and actually enjoying it and making, you know, thousands of better records out there as a result of it. And um, in 2015, I just had an idea. Wouldn't it be cool if I did a podcast about making the records in the studio, which is what I love doing anyway? Well, congrats for for doing it and still being around, man. I feel like I'm going to start a podcast is the let's get a band together of the current age. Like, yeah. uh, it's, as you know, so much easier said than done. But uh, I wouldn't discourage I, anybody from doing it anyway. I, I do not discourage people. But uh, the thing that I do tell them is if you want to start a podcast, record eight of them on your own before you release them and then see how you feel. Yeah. About it. Yeah. Uh, because oftentimes people realize that they're not really into what it takes to keep one going. Um, but just like I would never tell someone not to start a band or not to go for recording, of course, start a podcast if you want to. And, but just congrats on sticking it out. Yeah, thanks. I you too. Man. Know, I personally know how hard it is to keep it interesting. And thank you for creating such a cool um, community and platform as Nail the Mix and URM where you know, you've, you've created such an opportunity for people to learn how to do this stuff and do it well. Um, you know, a, a takeaway I got from what you said about um, the, the socializing aspect too is just, just how remarkable it is that the very same thing that is perfect for getting you into this in the first place that that like lonerism that is perfect for for putting you in your room listening to records until you are like good god i've got to go make records is the ver is the first hurdle you got to get over to actually go make records yeah it's kind of funny isn't it's it it's pretty wild yeah that's uh that w that is one of the biggest challenges i actually have with nail the mix um is that Lots of producers are not into being the center of attention. Yeah. Uh, and, but still, though, they know how to socialize or they wouldn't have gotten to where they are in their career. But you're absolutely right. You, to be good at this, you have to be comfortable sitting in a room 12 hours a day listening to a, a, the same loop. That's something that would make most people insane. You have to be okay with yeah. it. Like, that has to be... In you, I also yeah, I also say you have that to be able to hang. Uh, sorry, I also uh, say that we also have this accompanying skill, which is the ability to forget what we just listened to for twelve hours <laughs> yesterday. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to listen to it for twelve hours again today. Yeah, that, that's super important. Because <laughs> <laughs> people ask me, like, "What'd you do last week?" I'm like, I, "I can't remember what what did I do last? What was that last record?" And then you're like, "Oh yeah." Well, dude, thanks so much for being on the podcast with us, man. What a what a trip having you here, and and I look forward to uh, hopefully doing this again with you. Um, let's let's. I'd love to have you back on in the future, and we'll talk more about this stuff. Let the rock stars know uh, how they can find you online. Where should they go to learn more about URM and nail the mix and and go listen to your music? So, if you go to URM dot academy, that's our site. Uh, no.com, just urm.academy. And that's where you'll find the podcast and you know, the mix and uh, basically any of that stuff. If you want to get better at guitar, just go to riffhard.com. Uh, if you want to find me on Instagram, uh, A.L. Levy URM Audio. That's E Y A L L E V I U R M Audio. Dude, that's great, man. Well, what a pleasure hanging with you, man. Um, I hope you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I'm going to reiterate this again, rock stars. We are we are doing this in the time of the age of of Corona lockdown, and so hopefully, as we're listening to this, um, Al, you, your family, me, we're all healthy and well, and you two, rock stars. And thank you so much for being here, dude. Thanks for having me. All right, man. I hope to see you in person in the studio soon. Hope so too. Cheers, man. 
Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, PreSonus, Spectra 1964, and API Audio. You will find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. So thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.